So without further ado, um, I'm going to now formally convene this session with a few comments. And my comments really are about returning to the title of this forum, Planetary Feminisms, Decoloniality, Ecological Thinking, and Creative Praxis. The title um, took a ridiculously long time to formulate, um, which is one of my um, titles or my nemesis. Um, and, but the whole event really has been in process for a number of years. And I've really been thinking about trying to host something like this for a long time. And it's built on the two volumes that you're seeing there, which are the first two volumes of a trilogy project that I've been working on for some five years, but which is the culmination of probably 20 years of work, um, transnational feminisms and the arts. So the, um, the appearance of the second volume in January was sort of acted as an impetus to me. I, I thought I, I need to stop thinking about having a trans hemispheric dialogue and trying to bring these conversations together and actually try to do it. And the point of it in a sense and trying to think through planetary feminisms, decoloniality, ecological thinking and creative practice is really sort of coming from the volumes as they are unfolding. And the first one looking very much at the politics of transversal dialogue in relation to this, with the notion of knowing, imagining, and inhabiting earthwide and otherwise. And the second volume, which is very much more thinking about how we imagine histories, trans-hemispheric histories, ecologies and genealogies, worlds and stories, how we might think about storying pluriversal worlds and worlding pluriversal story, stories into the future. And the particular nexus of this is this nexus of decoloniality and eco-criticality, a profoundly kind of feminist project. And in a sense, my argument, and the kind of echoing, very much echoing um, Angela Davis um, and her comments on abolition feminism, my contention is that planetary feminisms are at their very best, decolonial, race critical, queer, trans, ecological ways of thinking, knowing, and doing, and that they mobilize crossings and connections of the trans, not a between two anterior pures, but a nexus of bodies, spaces, and times, the translocal, transregional, transnational, the transversal, transcorporeal, the transscalar, the transcanonical, and of course, the transhemispheric. Um, it's my contention that the decolonial, eco-critical planetarity of transnational feminisms in the arts can unravel some of the extractive Eurocentric and anthropocentric ways of knowing that have led to genocides, femicides, ecocides, and epistemicides. But more importantly, that they can start to build questions around mutual flourishing between the human and more than human earth others through creativity and through dialogue. And dialogue is central to this. The very first volume of, the, of this project opened in dialogue with ecofeminist Chris J. Cuomo, who wrote, any piece of philosophy is merely part of a conversation. I also echo Nira Yuval Davis and of course, Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde who said, we have many different faces and we do not have to become one another to work together. And I'm really interested in that notion of dialogue and coalitional praxis. So as we begin now to move toward round table one, this is like, get ready, Michelle. Um, uh, we are now moving to a round table where we are bringing colleagues together from Alte Aotearoa, New Zealand, Australia, the Asia Pacific, South Asia, and the Cape. We trace oceanic critical archipelagic histories of the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. We ask key questions of the past in the present and the future. We explore the possibilities of histories which are always marked by the infection of contact. Thank you, Lisa, for that wonderful phrase, infection. We do wake work. We do wake work of transscalar, transhemispheric tales in the aftermath of encounter and in the afterlives of extractive genocidal activities. But we also do that work in the hope of storying pluriversal worlds and worlding pluriversal stories for different futures. And I'm now gonna open with Michelle's first slide. Thank you, Marsha. So let me start by extending my sincere thanks to you, Professor Marsha Ms. Kimmon, and the Roundtable organizers for their amazing efforts putting together this extraordinary event. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be part of this Roundtable celebrating the publication of Professor Ms. Kimmon's new book, Transnational Feminisms and Arts, Trans Hemispheric Histories, 
My warm congratulations to Marsha on this latest achievement and my sincere thanks for generously opening up this opportunity for us all to share in conversations regarding the urgent reshaping of arts histories, which your work so eloquently, so inspiringly and so compellingly encourages us to do. I speak from the lands of the Indigenous Unwurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation, which sits adjacent to the locality of Nam, also now known as the city of Melbourne, after British colonisation of Australia and subsequent waves of migration of people from all over the world. In this context, I acknowledge the Unwurrung people's continuing relationship to this land and recognise that sovereignty was never ceded by them, and I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders past, present and emerging. Testimony to Indigenous strength and resilience, I also acknowledge the enduring and distinctive cultural traditions and creative practices of Indigenous communities here and everywhere in the world. So with this context in mind and registering the complex intersection of Indigenous, colonial and migrant histories that shape where I'm working from, let me now move on to considerations of my research on the shapes of contemporary Asian art particularly of Southeast Asia, which is in fact to undertake a north facing trajectory from Australia. How do you colonize someone? Asks artist Yi Ilan, an artist who based herself in Malaysia's capital city of Kuala Lumpur for over two decades before returning in 2016 to her hometown of Kota Kinabalu in Sabah, East Malaysia, on the northern part of Borneo Island and where her art practice has taken quite a different turn in recent years. Much of Yi's art practice, as she describes it, is about unpacking histories, notions of what power is and who has power in our storytelling. Lately, Yi has shifted from her well-established photo media-based practice to pursue collaborative map-making traditions prevalent throughout Southeast Asia. These are long-standing yet ever-evolving weaving traditions, primarily practiced between and passed on by different communities of Indigenous women across the region. Yi explains that prior to colonialism, there were no tables in the Southeast Asian archipelago, only woven mats for sitting, eating, communing, being together and sharing stories, among other things. For Yi, this is in stark contrast to the hierarchical patriarchal structures represented by the colonial table and the violence of colonial administration. This is how you colonise someone, Yi is telling us. This violence of administration represented by the table is more lethal, more violent than a gun, she says. Powerfully, she articulates that with a gun, the colonizer may just shoot you. With a table, with administration, the colonizer will tell you who you are, tell you what your history is, what is valuable to be kept in a museum and what is not, what language means, what languages you should use, what languages you should learn, what is of value. This indoctrination into the mind, Yi asserts, becomes inherited violence. Importantly for Yi, the woven mat is also a social architecture, calling people to commune together, to share a platform. Alongside recalling its pre-colonial origins, Yi regards the mat as fundamentally feminist and egalitarian through its horizontal organization and communal social structure. It's also for her a socially inclusive architectural object, if there are too many people on a mat, the host need only quickly lay down another to widen the collective space. In short, Yi tells us that for her, the practice of decolonizing in Southeast Asia is to see the table and to see the mat in juxtaposition. Just as we see here with her work, Tika Meja, which juxtaposes the power of the table against the power of the mat. With both in view, we are able to recognise the structural impositions and violence of colonialism and patriarchy on the one hand, and the pre-colonial and continuing knowledges, heritage and culture of women on the other. Yi also likes to think of the table being swallowed up by the mat, like in the hand game of rock, paper, scissors, a table on a mat can be engulfed, like a stone on paper that can be enclosed in a fist. Through such collaborative woven works, Yi has also begun to conceptualise her interest in the graphic and symbolic sign of the ampersand, or the and. She says, the ampersand is a bridge, it holds hands, and joins something to something else, it wants to include. I think this metaphor of the and is pertinent to thinking about the regional context and shapes of contemporary Southeast Asian art. We can conceptualise Southeast Asia itself as a woven mat, 
which through its myriad cultural, social, political, historical and creative interweavings is an exploration of the and that enables us to weave connections across the multiplicities of the region and beyond. As Singaporean writer, curator and artist Susie Lingham notes, the quintessence of Asianness, in particular Southeast Asianness, is already a paradoxical multiplicity, not merely reducible to a single motif, but a repetition of morphing motifs. The and, I suggest, allows us to join and behold the differentiated multiplicities of Southeast Asia. Put differently again, this is the transnational at work, a transnational which precedes the modern naming and territorial demarcation of Southeast Asia, which arose from imperial, colonial and Cold War politics and claims to the region. This is instead a weaving of transnationalisms which reasserts the different pre-national and pre-colonial connections, cultural histories and shapes of Southeast Asia across land and sea. It is moreover a mat literally formed from the different eco-materialities which grow in and around the region as bamboo reeds and pandunus grasses, and which in these collaborations are harvested by weavers and replaced by new plantings for future use. They are mats made by rural and mountainous peoples, as well as those whose lives are influenced by the archipelagic region's watery habitats, not bound by the colonial confines of earthbound territories. These mats sustained livelihoods through a circular and environmentally sustainable economy of trade in mats, interrupted and discouraged by colonial and capitalist economies. Yi and her collaborators are reinstituting these economies. For Yi, the mats are also irrefutably of the contemporary and manifestations of the contemporary art of Southeast Asia. They are therefore also an intervention into the accepted canons of contemporary art making and contemporary art history. Previously, such works would be relegated outside of art in Western museums, positioned instead for their ethnographic or natural history value as exoticized craft objects of the cultural other, fixing indigenous people and their creativity within unchanging practices of the past. Now asserted as living creativity and culture, these maps have recently been exhibited and collected as contemporary art, so as to also include those creative traditions which carry the past with them in the present. For Yi, this museological shift is an act of flipping the table and lifting the mat and turning the tables on the museum so the museum becomes more like a mat as opposed to a table. This interest in how Southeast Asian women artists such as Yi are inviting us to critically rethink the terms, shapes and worlds of art is something I took up in co-curating an exhibition in Singapore in 2019 with fellow art historian Wulan Dugan Toro. Entitled Shaping Geographies, Art, Woman, Southeast Asia, we asked ourselves how the coming together of art, woman and Southeast Asia could be configured to acknowledge the ongoing, but also new ways that these terms bear significance for and to Southeast Asian contemporary women artists and their practices. We conceived of Southeast Asia as a porous and open entity of multiple shapes and scales of the intimate and the personal. This included considerations of Southeast Asian diasporic and inter-Asia experiences as further kinds of cross-cultural and transnational iterations of Southeast Asianness, or as I'm describing it here, the Southeast Asian as and. Not limiting our explorations to literal geographies, with the participating artists we explored how the archives of history are being challenged the persistence of the radical body, the intimacies of lived personal experience and affective encounter, communal and collaborative endeavors beyond the self, and how to navigate and work through social and ecological challenges of our times in ways that counter the patriarchal thinking and structures that have contributed to these. Echoing Marsha's recent thinking for her new book, these artists' vital contributions and interventions give us hope for thinking through and enacting other possible worlds at this critical juncture in our history. Thank you. Hello, lovely to be here. Um, thank you so much to the organizers for this opportunity to speak together. I'm thrilled and really honored to share space with you all. Um, and of course, huge congratulations to Marsha on the publication of this 
really significant, important text. I also want to acknowledge all Indigenous communities and elders, past, present and future, with whom we might also be sharing space today. I'm speaking to you from Rome, but home for me um, as an uninvited migrant is Wadundi Noongar Budja, southwest of Bulu, Perth. Um, and I usually reside on the lands of the Lenny Lenape peoples in Princeton, New Jersey. Just a note too, before I start is this presentation does contain images of, um, or does contain uh, an image of dead ancestors. Next to me on the screen is a photograph of a sugar plantation. The plantation's paradoxical status as both enclosed and mobile reinforces its centrality to understanding the processes and effects of the migratory flows of people, products, capital, whose circuits continue to sustain us um, today. Yet the plantation is very often a visual image or a physical space only associated with the Atlantic world. You'll notice here in this photograph that the cane is much taller than the women and young child who stand with their cutting tools, watching each other and their surrounds. Are they resting? For how long have they decided to stop work? What is being said to them from behind the camera? These are women and children on a sugar plantation in the north of Mingjin, Queensland. They've been kidnapped and enslaved, brought across from one of 80 Pacific islands and first forced to work in Australia's growing sugar industry in the latter half of the 19th century. There are so many of these kinds of photographs and archives in Australia, but the story of these women and their South Sea Islander communities has only really been part of the public sphere in Australia in the last two decades, thanks to the work of pioneering women such as Imelda Miller and Professor Tracy Benivano, Benivano Ma. Photographs like these of plantations and plantation workers, enslaved and unfree, also connect hemispheric spaces across the world that were part of European empires, whose economy, politics and cultural production were sustained by the plantation. Now, although Australia's plantation histories remain understudied, photographs like this provide us with ways of contextualizing these stories within a more global history of slavery and colonialism that connects the Atlantic, Indian and Pacific oceans. A woman near the center of the group has her back to us. She wears a round bowler-like hat. Her skirts are cinched around her hips with a sash. She stands almost in contra contraposto, her feet slightly separated, her torso slightly turned, her shoulders loosened. She's still yet alert. She looks sideways across to her left and we must follow. Her gaze directly falls on the figure of a woman, the artist Jasmine Togo Brisby, who's wrapped in a patterned dress, whose curly hair falls down past her shoulders. Jasmine is an Australian South Sea Islander. She's descended from these people who were forcibly brought across to Australia, and her great great grandparents were forcibly taken from Vanuatu as children. This practice lasted from about 1863 to 1904. And after this, many of the community were deported back to the South Sea Islanders because of the white Australia policy. So this has led to a double erasure of their story, these women's stories, reinforced by the loss of culture and language. The shadows of the sugarcane fall across Jasmine's arms like sinewy tattoos. She's imprinted by this ecology, but she's not bound. While she stands alongside these women, her gaze takes us out of the photograph out of the scene and out of the plantation. In fact, as we notice this, we might also notice again how these women literally embedded in the plantation are also shown, at least for a moment, holding their own time amidst the oversight and regulatory violence of plantation management. Jasmine's gaze, her spatial relationship to the plantation is both derived from the woman she surrounds herself with but also helps us to look again differently at where they are, how they stand, what they're doing. Notice too that while she stands alongside them, she puts herself between the viewer and these women, almost like a mediator and a protector. To look at them, we must first look with her. We can't move into the future without knowing the past. Jasmine told me this when I first spoke with her several years ago. 
She's articulating a way of being and a plan of action for moving forward. Her work materializes an indigenous temporality that emphasizes both the intertwined nature of the past and the future and the importance of drawing on the past to conceive of and build these futures. Jasmine describes it this way, and I'm quoting directly from her here. By inserting us, us as in herself and her family, she also inserts pictures of her mother and her daughter into these photographs. By inserting us within the images dimensions, I create a visual genealogy that connects and reframes these unknown figures as ancestor figures. My process asserts that these inherited Im images are not obfuscated solely by their colonial framing, but that they embody the living air of a people. It is an air that indigenous scholar Louise Owens describes as being visible to those looking from within rather than without. That's the end of the quote. Returning to the archive and to the plantation is a process of repair and care for Jasmine. It's a way of laying to rest and of bringing together ancestors and descendants that speaks of endurance and survivance. It is also a way of positioning her story and her community's history within the broader history of enslavement and colonialism that I mentioned earlier, histories from which they have also been sidelined. And finally, her work is a process that reorientates us as viewers. We move from observers to being called on as witnesses, directing our attention to these practices of healing, survivance, and refusal. Jasmine finds in the archive a way to articulate different modes of connection for each other and the land that emerge from perhaps because of these plantation histories, but are never contained by them. Thank you. Kilda Kota Kato. Uh, ngā mihi nui he tangata tūturu o tēnei me te raha whenua, o mua i nai nei me hiki mai ki a koutou katoa. Ko nga toki matawharo o taku waka, ko te hokianga o kūpei taku moana, ko puhanga tohora me nihi aku moana, ko mangatawa me ōtaua ngā awa, ko ngā puhi taku iwi. Kolisa Rehana Taku Ingoa. Um, firstly, my um, thanks and congratulations to Marsha. And I'd really like to acknowledge the, all the other speakers that are here today. It's um, a great honor to, to be able to share some ideas and thoughts around decoloniality. Um, look, I, I would like to say I, I um, operate from the position of a I suppose a woman of colour that really likes to grab technology um, by the neck and um, take it as far as I can go in order to sort of challenge um, the works and representations that have come before, but also to use it as a productive tool um, to create spaces for Māori, Pacific and Indigenous peoples, indeed everybody beyond that of all genders, of all places, to feel like there's a space um, that we can tell our stories. But certainly, um, as in my pepiha, where I um, talked about the waka, that my people arrived in New Zealand, the moana, which is hokianga, and my iwi, um, these, these spaces, the Moana, the Pacific Ocean, the oceans are a superhighway, and this is how we've traveled across the lands. So I made this work in pursuit of Venus infected. In fact, I made two versions. I started initially trying to work out how to make the work because I had this kind of eureka moment and decided I'd seen this wallpaper at the National Gallery of Australia and um, was completely flummoxed by it because the uh, wall label 
told me that it was uh, people drawn from across the Pacific. And uh, it's a French scenic wallpaper called Les Sauvages de la Mer Pacifique, uh, made by um, Joseph Dufour. And he was really uh, taking journal accounts and the first illustrations of these journeys um, by De La Perouse, um, Bougainville and James Cook. And they circulated um, for armchair travelers um, very much so um, becoming like the kind of populist imagery of the day. Um, when I saw this wallpaper, you know, 250 years later, it surprised me how little the, um, the imagery and the, the representation of Pacific people, uh, you know, I just couldn't see them. So one day I was thinking about what artwork to make and I decided it would be really great to turn this wallpaper into a moving image um, work. Uh, what you see in the slide is probably a representation of maybe two and a half minutes worth of um, imagery that sc scrolls very slowly across the screen from right to left. Um, and below, we've just taken a few images to, to show you some details of what's happening within this, this wallpaper. But certainly what I wanted to do was change, change the storylines, change the vignettes. Um, create, use this wallpaper as a platform to invite Pacific people to speak upon and to talk through history and time. Um, and also to implicate the European explorers who were certainly um, uh, journeying across the Pacific, uh, looking for initially the transit of Venus, but of course the transit of Venus is um, locked to notions of latitude, resource extraction, creating the maps of the day to find out how to, um, to, to transit the oceans and come down to our part of the world. So this particular work for me is bringing these two people side by side and kind of really trying to have a reckoning. One of the things that I was thinking about, um, you know, it's not a reconstruction of the past, but it's a regenerative imaginative inquiry into a contemporaneous cultural present and future. All the people who are acting in the work, um, they, are the, they are the living embodiment of their ancestors, some of whom will have been, you know, in the islands at the time that these explorers were, were traveling through. Um, some of the things I really wanted to do with this work was to choose um, narratives, vignettes, and contrast them, try and help uh, people work out what was happening in this work. It's, it's quite an overwhelming work. There's a lot of stuff going on. You need to sit with it for a long time. Um, but I would compare things, things such as um, storytelling, live performance, um, costume. So that's something that you're seeing playing out right across this this pictorial space uh, sometimes in the audience I really wanted them to put the audience on the side as tangata whenua and when I mean that I mean people of the land which is watching the ships arrive you know giving agency back to the people who who owned the land who knew it intimately so I thought I've, in this project you know I'm trying to harness filmic techniques and animation te technologies, but to show, show these stories from a Pacific perspective. It was very interesting, Michelle, to see E.I. Lan and think about uh, the tables and that being a colonial furniture because Pacific people sat on the ground. Um, and throughout this project, there's some very key figures such as Captain Cook, Joseph Banks, and Joseph Banks is often shown uh, with a trading table. So I think it's it's kind of looking at the difference of how they were recording the material, the transit of Venus, and then having a group of Pacific people sort of talking about, you know, intimately knowing a map of the heavens. 
and trying to have this kind of cross-cultural communication. A really strong part of this project is audio, um, the soundtrack, the sounds to try and evoke, you know, the smell of the beach, you hear waves, you hear the birds. Um, but I also have uh, used Bach because he was the populist music of the time. Uh, we chose a, a piece of Bach's writing that was an unfinished uh, uh, symphony and it's a kind of keeps looping much like the the video loops around and it's sort of to give people that sense of time is unfinished uh, for Maori um, past present and future can all coexist in the same place so this technique of you know a looping unending uh, video work starts to or well, I, I hope conveys to the audience the sense of cyclical time and how Pacific people understand um, a different sense of time. Um, I also wanted to, in pursuit of Venus, you know, if you use a filmic term, term point of view, I really wanted to, you know, uh, sh show how Pacific people understood what was happening in quite a different way. Tupaya was this very interesting Tahitian um, Arioi uh, navigator. He joined at um, Joseph Banks' um, uh, behest. He joined the journey. Uh, but one of the things I was, you know, some of the vignettes I chose to make were based on things that he observed, the drawings that he made. I also looked at tattoo or tattoo culture um, and that sharing of illustration um, and marking of the body. I really wanted to get across this concept of tribalism. So Captain Cook or, you know, on board these small vessels, there were very specific groups that would be on board. So there was a type of tribalism that sort of playing out the midshipmen, the, the upper echelons, the crew, the much, you know, so there's a sort of stratification that happens on board. So across this project, you see a variety of things happening. Kia ora, thank you. Good morning uh, or afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, like my fellow presenters, I'd like to give thanks to Marsha uh, for this remarkable opportunity to share with my academic kin from across the world. And I also want to thank the artist I'm talking about today, Leora Faber, who I think is here this morning, for her remarkable body of work and for collaborating with me to help make, make meaning of it. What you are looking at is a still life from an installation titled Disquieting Domesticities, Vestiges of Violence by South African artist Leora Faber at the Iziko South African National Gallery last year. This installation was the result of a bio art project that she's been working on for years, traversing the divide between scientists' laboratory and artists' studio, Faber painted with naturally pigmented bacteria and cast with live SCOBY, the thin, fragile skin of bacteria and yeast that kombucha is made from, to produce a variety of objects, installations and video art. Using Donna Haraway's concept of the material semiotic knot, as well as a variety of other feminist new materialist terms and concepts, I will show how Farbe explores the entanglement of settler colonial history, capitalist consumption, the gendered nature of family heritage and domesticity, and multi-species becomings through her bioart. Working with live cultures of bacteria and yeast, the word culture assumes more complex meanings in this work, evoking as it does the Latin root of the word, colere, to cultivate. In an interview, the artist recounts how much attention and care it took to produce exactly the right thickness of SCOBY for her projects, regular administration of teas and sugar, the constant need to regulate temperatures and hum humidity. She spoke of how tenuous and unreliable her, her control was of the outcomes, 
how each product was a surprise crafted by the desires and mysterious inclinations of the prolific single cell life forms that she cultivated and cared for. An ethic of care was called for, constant attentiveness and responsiveness rather than mastery and control. The meniality and domesticity of this tending and caring is a form of agency that stands in stark contrast to the notion of the creator as genius, the freestanding, virile, masculine creator. The elitist European conception of culture as learning, refined taste and civilization, so long used to justify and cement world dominance, makes way for culture as a multi-species event. In contrast to the whitely sameness and hardness of marble edifices built to glorify man, the measure of all things, these febrile, transient objects stain the world a brilliant hue before they fragment, melt and dissolve. The enlightenment trope of the self-made man, the conceptual bedrock of capitalism, makes way for beings that constitute one another, and I quote Karin Barad, through their reaching into each other, through their prehensions or graspings. These still lives are a result of collaborative storytelling, a research assemblage involving innumerable hungry single cell organisms, the artist, and rather poetically, tea and sugar, those vital monocrops of early capitalist development tended by displaced and enslaved dog bodies. Serpil Opperman calls this semiotic property of the material storied matter, a material mesh of meanings, properties, and processes in which human and non-human players are interlocked. Just as the binaries of nature and culture are undone by these installations, masculine and feminine domains become blurred in the traversing of the domestic and the laboratory. In settler households, the inherited China were very valuable family heirlooms vested with cultural status, but also largely perceived as a woman's dowry. The product of centuries of exchange between East and West, they speak of globalization and the stark racialized and gendered inequities of colonial existence, but also of the familiar, the temporary safeness of the home in the threatening strangeness of the colony. But the title of the installation hints at the unsettling of the domestic as a place of safety to a place of uncanny instability and constant change. As a product of the Jewish diaspora, Leora Faber recounts how such fragile family heirlooms were handed down via matriarchal lines from generation to generation, despite horrific pogroms, genocides and displacements. Homely artifacts that tell uncanny familial stories of trauma, violence, and temporary refuge. Through these febrile, fragile objects cast from live materials, the domestic is revealed as an uncanny domain where the familial and familiar is rendered strange, vulnerable, and transient. Yet, as a white South African, they also tell of her legacy of privilege and class lines drawn on the skin. The domestic realm was where the settler and the servant were most closely enmeshed and revealed the denied dependency of the master on the slave. These still lives also tell of the strange intimacy of the colonial encounter, where black bodies were tasked with the care of these precarious artifacts, but were allocated tin cups and plates for their own use. The abject black body kept at a distance to prevent contamination yet needed close to mop up the abjected remainders of the white body. In these works, skin is a potent metaphor of liminality, but more than that, in the racial capitalocene, skin is a marker of status, the ultimate bearer of the stigmatic sign of apartheid. Nowhere is the enmeshment of the bodily and the semiotic more clearly revealed than in the human skin. Through Faber's works, we are reminded that the human skin, like the scoby, is porous, that it is a vast breathing and weeping organ, not so much a shell as itself a rich microbial ecosystem, an entire world. The human skin, like the scoby, is an interspecies collaboration, 
a prolific site of intermingling and rampant contaminations and invasions. The still life is the quintessential genre of the Dutch Golden Age, an era of capitalist expansion and rampant materialism that formed the bedrock of the Enlightenment thinking that instrumentalized, enslaved, and appropriated all planetary matter to human ends. The slow decomposition of the still lives, they change a lot over time. So if you go back, you see them becoming drier and shriveling up and eventually completely uh, fragmenting. The slow de decomposition of the still lives is a kind of memento mori, evoking the Dutch tradition of vanitas, through which the hubris of the modern European project of progress and human exceptionalism stands starkly exposed. They speak of excess, of the luxury of a world's resources spread on the table for white bodies to feast on, but also of the aftermath of this feast, the decay and collapse of the material world during this, the disastrous capitalism. Faber's still life installation thus plays with the term still life as still alive, not only because the SCOBY is literally live matter, but also to hint at the extent to which the present is haunted by the ghosts of the past. As ontological objects, these still lives are neither fully present nor absent, but hint at a spectrality that confounds the distinction between the virtual and the real. A lot of uh, film um, installations were also produced of these works. This is what Lorenzo Veracini calls the settler colonial present a post-colonial world that is haunted by the effects and effects of centuries of extractive capitalism, monocrops, slavery, and the instrumentalization of human and animal bodies. Ghosts remind us that we are, we live in an impossible present, right sing at all, a time of capture, a world haunted by the threat of extinction. Veracini uses another metaphor that is pertinent here. He likens settler colonialism to a bacterial infection, which overruns and transforms the body it invades. The settler colonial attempt to obliterate the indigenous body, to render it invisible through genocide, cultural appropriation, and other forms of literal and symbolic violence, is akin to a pathogenic bacterial infection. And I will leave it there. Um, finally, we, we have to see this as an artistic creation that is also an act of radical feminist care. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present today. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians um, on the land in which I'm presenting, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and to sincerely pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also really like to acknowledge um, my First Nations colleagues at the National Gallery who are helping us retell the stories. And, you know, I'm very um, moved and honoured to be here with um, the wonderful speakers who have already spoken and who are yet to speak. Um, and thank you, Marsha, for this, this brilliant opportunity and for um, your wonderful insights in your publications, including your recent publication. So congratulations on that. You know, I, I would um, like to deviate from my script for a minute to say that, um, you know, it's a real honor to hear Lisa Rehana talk um, about her very moving work. And that at the National Gallery, you know, in the last few years, we've been at a real turning point in our history and the way that we retell our stories. You know, it's um, a couple of words that um, were mentioned before about reckoning, reckoning with the past, you know, don't let's just keep retelling the same stories, you know, the Dufour work that, you know, um, Lisa has so brilliantly transformed to bring a greater understanding to um, uh, those people and place, uh, you know, is so critical. And so we no longer show that work in isolation. Um, it's, it's really important when we go in just recently, we 
we've been rehanging our um, collections of Australian art, and we would never any longer start by talking about the British settlers who came to Australia, Mr. and Mrs. Solomon on the boat, who arrived on our shores. We think instead of those people who were here more than 65,000 years ago, that we need to really acknowledge their histories, their stories, the diversity of cultures, and the tremendous um, insights that they can bring to our knowledge of place. And, you know, I think um, certainly on the wider political scene at the moment, there's a lot of discussion going on about um, greater recognition in our constitution. And um, I think it's an extremely important debate to be having. Um, so, as I say, we're, we're really thinking about how we retell our stories. And I'm showing you on the screen here a work um, by the artist Fiona Hall. It's a work that was included um, in our Know My Name exhibition, the first part of that exhibition. And what I'm going to do in this talk is, is focus briefly on this particular work, um, because I think it has some very interesting resonances with the themes that um, we're talking about in this round table, um, and then talk a little bit more broadly about the Know My Name initiative. So this work by Fiona Hall is called Tender. It's from the Queensland Art Gallery, um, Quag Gomez collection, which they kindly loaned um, to the Know My Name initiative, was to, which was really to redress the imbalance of the way that our histories have focused on male artists. You know, there was some pushback when we started about having um, a, a two exhibitions of women artists and actually we had to tell them the news that that was just the start because clearly even in two large exhibitions we could not redress um, the shortcomings of the past which have not acknowledged the place of, of women in our stories. So to focus briefly on um, the work by Fiona Hall called Tender, I really love the name the title of this, Tender as in currency and Tender as in tenderness, a sense of care. So what Fiona has done here, and I really loved um, the, uh, I guess, provo provocation, Marsha, that you put forward about not being afraid to talk about the, pre the pleasures of disciplinary disobedience, co-curating new ecologies of knowledge. And I think, you know, what is so fascinating about this work is that Fiona has shredded US dollar bills. So in other words, taking away the idea of currency, like again, what does the word currency mean? But this idea of a world that is so focused on materialism, on, um, you know, rampant development at the expense of nature. And what Fiona did was really go and study these, the extraordinary um, work that birds do in constructing their nests. And, you know, you just think about some of the language that we use, like bird brains. I mean, honestly, human beings are sometimes so unevolved, you know, the incredible um, architects that birds are to create these extraordinary structures. And it's a work of complexity. It's a work that invites awe and wonder at, at what nature um, does all around us all the time if we're only willing to step back and look and consider and take the time to think about it. You know, it's also a work that implies loss, these empty nests um, and the idea that Lee's put forward of haunting, this haunting on so many levels that we're having to deal with in the 21st century. In another work um, using banknotes that Hall did called Leaf Litter in the collection of the National Gallery in Canberra, the artist looks at the extraordinary layered and complex history of banknotes, which in themselves are like little tableau that tell histories. And they're painted with the images of specific plant species. And I'd like to um, quote um, from my wonderful colleague, uh, Julie Ewington, who wrote a book on the artist, Fiona Hall. She said, money doesn't grow on trees, or does it? Plants have played a crucial role in the history of colonization and the development, development of world economies. Many species have been responsible for the rapid growth of European power and wealth over the past 500 years. Plants, and along with them people, have been shifted across oceans. Battles have been waged over them, forests raised, but everything comes at a price. 
And now we are paying heavily for overtaxing the environment and for cultivating an ever widening gap between rich and poor nations. Many of the, the once most plant resource rich countries are now among the poorest on earth. So these are things for us to really reckon with. Paul's tender was part, as I said, of the Know My Name initiative at the National Gallery. This initiative was, is a commitment and a call to action. And even though it's been going since 2019, we are still just at the beginning. It's a gender equity initiative, um, celebrating the work of women artists and gender diverse artists with the aim to un understand and enhance our um, reckoning with the contribution of artists to our cultural life in Australia and more widely. The aim is to address historical gender bias, to reconsider the stories of art, to elevate the voices of all women and gender diverse artists. The National Gallery recognises that in the collections of Australia's major cultural institutions, including our own, in exhibition programs and in the canon of art history, the art of women has not been represented to the same depth or degree as men. I mean, that's pretty obvious. And, you know, when we did the stats with the help of the county report, who are an incredible organisation um, gathering data around the country, um, we found that 25% of our collection um, was representing women. And we really um, feel keenly the need to address that. And the very sad news is that there are quite a lot of other galleries who also um, are, are really underrepresenting women. So you know, I'm sure that um, it's an experience that is familiar to artists across the globe. I mean, it's such a wonderful opportunity to share our stories together. And I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Warwick in the UK. And I remember that we had H.W. Janssen's History of Art, which was first printed in 1962, I think, that ran to 572 pages and didn't contain the work of a single woman until it was republished in 1986. For people who say to me, why do we need to know my name. I think, you know, there are so many examples like that. Another was Ernst Gombrich, The Story of Art, um, published in 1950 that ran to over 650 pages. And apart from in the first edition, apart from the German edition, which included a work by Peter Kollowitz, um, there were no women artists. The Know My Name book that accompanied need um, our exhibition included the work of 150 women artists written by 115 um, women writers. You know, I think um, one of the things that we found when we were um, really addressing issues to do with feminism, activism, and how we move forward. We looked back at the histories, at the waves of activism in the art of, of Australian women artists, and uh, we really saw how much there was to do. And I'm about to hand over to the wonderful Janet Lawrence, whose work was also on display, um, you know, very close to Fiona's, along with an, a large number of First Nations artists um, who we're very proud to be able to represent. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am so delighted to be here. I come, I speak to you uh, this evening from Victoria on the, um, from the land of the Wurundjeri people from the Kulam Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders and future beings and ask always for their guidance. I'd like to begin with a quote by Deborah Bird Rose for my work here, um, which is actually a work from the Know My Name show, a big vitrine work. And this is in fact a detail from inside it. So it looks a little <laughs> confusing, I'm sure. If we could hear the call of those who are slipping out of life forever, there we might encounter a narrative emerging from extinctions, a level of blood that connects us. My work traverses multiple temporalities. It examines and reveals evolving intersections between art, science, humanity, and the natural world. I play with memory, matter, ephemerality, and transience and focus on our threatened environments. 
as well as looking to cultural and physical rest restoration of them, which of course brings me into very political territory. Living in Australia, we're patently aware that we are indeed in the age of the sixth extinction. We witness it daily in our news readings and observations. The great majority of Australian plants and animals are found nowhere else on earth. They are precious, precious repositories of unique genes and evolutionary strategies and living in unique ecosystems. And as Tim Flannery has said, they provide Australians with the best means of engaging nature and listening to our land. And well, we need to do this. We profess to love our wildlife, but the political and economic compromise allow it to be traded off. And thus, we are a country of massive extinction. I feel that love in the time of catastrophe and extinction calls for another set of questions. Who are we as a species and how do we fit into this complex system on our planet? We need to find our way into new stories to guide us. How can we invigorate love and action in ways that are generous and knowledgeable and life affirming? I'm interested in how in art, in its, all its forms, can awaken wonder and imagination, curiosity and love. Because I feel that art enables us to explore our consciousness and unconsciousness, the seen and the unseen, the heard and the silent. It can light up details, creating a matrix that transforms old thoughts into new ideas. It can open up spaces and times into being and where rationality no longer works or has come to a limit and, uh, and really is stuck. Art combines such a range of different fields which cross, you know, from history, spirituality, mythology, science, philosophy, poetry, personal, the public, etc., And it can synthesize these to create stories and actions that transform our everyday experience of the world and, and one another. Art speaks to the heart and the soul, a language of emotion, and hereby awakens in us, a, hopefully, a deeper empathy towards other beings with different experiences than our own. It can bring people along with it, tell stories and facilitate sharing and create hope through creativity. We may be very familiar with intimate forms of joy, giving, loving, caring, but now we need to scale it up into a form of planetary generosity. An artist is a free speaker, one who can speak truths that we normally cannot bear to hear, or others are limited in what they're allowed to say. So we must, of course, find hope and live within it. For me, making work gives me that space of possibility. That is, hope as an active space. It enables me to remain within the world of nature that I love. I want to see nature from its own point of view, and I'm attempting to bring this into art as a form of empathy. My research moves between recording so much of what I see and search out the observations of nature in order to both celebrate the survival, beauty, complexity, and brilliance, and also record its destruction from both climate change and the direct actions of man. Thus, there's so much material to work with. And the work, of course, alters accordingly from environmental actions, protest pieces to direct and layered images of places of nature showing intimate details and sometimes a broader, <clears throat> a broader environmental approach and often the gathering of objects representing loss addressing our natural environment as the subject, I want to bring attention to its fragility and its total, our total interdependence upon it. For many years, my installations have explored the poetics of space and materiality, 
through the creation of site-specific works that deal with our, our relationship with the natural world. Creating types of wunderkammer echoing a natural history museum in our time of ecological crisis. Paying particular attention to the plight of plants, animals, other species and their loss of habitat. This work Requiem was a passionate response to create a work from the vast, for the vast exhibition of women artists that Deborah has just spoken to you about called Know My Name, curated by Deborah here on our panel. I had longed to make a work that gathered environmental loss and lamented and had been jolted by recent experiences of climate catastrophes. That is the furnace of burning bushfires that incinerated billions of our precious animals and forests. Concurrently with a gigantic hailstorm that smashed the CSIRO scientific glass houses, leaving in ruins years of food experiments. I just returned from a residency in Iceland where on the first day I witnessed the funeral of a glacier. So I was indeed very primed to make such a work. And the work is indeed a form of memento mori. It is about what we've lost and are continuing to lose. It's also a piece about memory and how it distills and alters reality. This, of course, parallels nature's ability for transformation. The dead tree in the forest creates a second nature for the life of microorganisms, fungi, soil, so that other plants can be regenerated. And art enables one to create the idea of spells that enable magical things to happen within the process of working. Within the vitrine, which is a large um, series of um, sort of a, a transparent boxes containing a huge range of objects and elements, I like to make suggestions of an alchemical afterlife, which gives me artistic freedom to play with transformations and imaginings, such as glass vials attached by threads to dried plants wrapped in mesh that I suggest the recording of their memory or their dreams. And this offers a whole new other avenue of exploration, having worked a lot with plants and the lives within them. There are photosynthetic processes cast as 3D prints from the electron microscope images that become crystalline forms just floating on mirror in which they are reflected. Death itself is distilled to a pure white powder as we do find it hard to look at death, while lost species of plants and animals are named in lists. Taxidermid specimens enable us to look at the dead. These specimens are transformed from their deep dark museum storage. Invisibility as a tangible symbol was once there. I've been lucky as an artist to move between inside and outside of natural museums. So I feel that art can bring us into this discussion across science and bring an, an emotional aspect and hopefully help to heal our ailing planet. Thank you very much. <laughs>